Uh, thank you everyone for coming. Uh, this is going to be a talk about the Mega 65, a modern recreation of the Commodore 65. Um, specifically, uh, this year I want to talk about uh, my personal time with the Mega 65 over the last couple of years. I, uh, some of you might have seen I gave a talk last year. I know a lot of you were here, were here last year and the, there's a video online. If you want more, a more general introduction of what the Mega 65 is. But I am going to spin through a quick introduction at the very beginning here uh, for anyone who might not be familiar with the Mega 65. Um, so yeah, um, I have been a Mega 65 owner uh, for two years. Uh, they first came out uh, a couple years ago. The pre-orders started in 2021 and they started shipping in 2022. There has been quite a bit of a, a gap uh, since then uh, due to supply chain issues. Uh, we are now shipping uh, new uh, computers just this year, uh, but a lot of people who have pre-ordered there have been waiting a long time. But I got in on the first batch, so I uh, uh, had, had mine for two years. Uh, I am a member of the Mega 65 Steering Committee. I am currently the uh, lead on the manual and the ROM. We'll talk about those projects a little bit. And I'm also the author of Dan's Mega 65 Digest, which is an email newsletter all about the Mega 65, all of the latest news and uh, various projects. I also write feature articles every month about uh, programming topics or just general interest on uh, how to get the most out of your Mega 65. I also do an audio podcast version of it. If you don't want to read it, uh, you can listen to me read it out loud. So this is the Commodore 65. Uh, it was never released. Commodore uh, did not release the Commodore 65. They planned it, they designed it, they built it, and they prototyped it. Uh, but they canceled the project pretty much at the last minute. They made a couple hundred prototypes and uh, never sold it. Uh, it was intended to be a successor to the Commodore 64 and Commodore 128. It's the, the last uh, uh, hurrah of their 8-bit uh, line. It had uh, a more advanced CPU, uh, more memory, more advanced video and sound. It had a, a new version of Commodore Basic. So Commodore uh, Basic 7 in the Commodore 128 is actually pretty powerful. They were uh, adding more features and making it uh, more, more fun to use uh, all the way up to Basic 10, which was uh, meant to ship with the Commodore 65. Uh, the C65 also had a built-in 3.5-inch floppy drive. Uh, but they never sold them. Uh, we know about this because those prototypes were actually sold on the open market when Commodore went bankrupt in 1994. So uh, a lucky few people, maybe a couple hundred people, managed to actually get one of these uh, to see what uh, they would have released, including uh, Paul Gardner Stephen. Uh, he was able to get one uh, a long time ago. Uh, he loved it very much, uh, but then he had to sell it for the usual reasons where we have to sell our things. Uh, but he missed it, and so he decided to recreate it. In 2014, he started the Mega 65 project uh, with the Museum of Electronic Games and Art. Uh, that's where Mega comes from. And uh, uh, they've been working on it ever since. It's been 10 years. It's a 10-year project so far. So the Mega 65 is a recreation of the Commodore 65. Um, and it was really about finishing what Commodore started. Those prototypes were unfinished. Uh, there was a lot of work that went into them. Uh, they were pretty cool machines on their own. You can kind of mess with them if you were very techy. But the uh, various features were uh, unimplemented or buggy. Uh, it was not really ready for prime time. And so a lot of the Mega 65 project, in addition to recreating the uh, hardware that you can purchase and uh, the chipset uh, to actually run the operating system, also involved finishing the operating system and finishing a lot of these features, fixing the bugs. As much of the project as possible is open source. That includes the FPGA uh, chipset. You can just get the source code, build it yourself, modify it as much as you want. Um, the FPGA-based internals means you can upgrade it. It's an upgradable machine. So as we continue to work on, extend, and fix the chipset, the actual chips inside it, uh, you can just upgrade that as firmware in your machine. So everyone gets a new Mega 65 every time we do a, a new release. This hardware platform also has modern hardware conveniences kind of out of necessity. It has uh, HDMI compatible digital video output, uh, things like that. There's an Ethernet jack for networking, thing, uh, along those lines. Uh, but it really is about sort of recreating uh, what it would have been like to own a Commodore 65 at the time. There are a couple parts that couldn't have been open sourced because we actually uh, used the Commodore 65 code, the original Commodore 65 ROM code for the operating system. Uh, so we've uh, uh, licensed that uh, so that we can re release our own versions. Uh, we operate on the actual source code uh, that Commodore wrote as we extend and fix things. 
So the Mega 65 uh, also has its own set of uh, extensions uh, to the Commodore 65, an even more sophisticated CPU. Uh, we can actually run at 40 megahertz, not just the 1 megahertz or 3 megahertz of the original CPU, uh, which is actually really compelling if you're writing a basic program. Running basic at 40 megahertz is really, really fun. Uh, you can do a lot of cool stuff with that just in basic without having to learn assembly language. Um, more RAM, even more video features, even more audio features and all this. You can get a little carried away with uh, extending something like this. You can get a little bit too far out of its place in history. And uh, I think we've done a really good job of uh, establishing this kind of a rule of only era appropriate extensions. If we're going to add a feature to the Mega 65, it would have had to have been something that would have existed on a computer in the early 1990s. Um, and so it still keeps it, uh, gives it a vintage feel, even though we're kind of expanding the territory. And I think a lot of the attraction of the platform is actually the newness of it. It's like a new old thing where it's unfamiliar. A lot of people are really enjoying exploring what does this mean, what does this look like, given these extensions, given uh, what it is. Um, uh, I've never seen a Commodore 65 before, but I've seen a Commodore 64. What is this idea extended out to the Commodore 65 like? Um, uh, yeah, I'm, I won't read through the whole feature list here, but you can see this is the back of it with the modern stuff. The Ethernet is worth calling out because we now have uh, network-based file transfer. Uh, you can send things from your PC to your Mega 65 and back uh, using a, a really simple and easy set of tools. It's been a, a, a great uh, new feature. Um, so it's not just about recreating what Commodore made, but to recreate the experience of getting a new Commodore and wondering about all the possibilities of what it's like. So that's why it comes in this really cool box. Uh, we will see an unboxing of a brand new Mega 65 after this talk. I'm kind of excited about that. Um, and uh, it comes with a, a, a printed manual and everything you need to get started. Um, so probably the best piece of news is what I sort of hinted at earlier. The Mega 65 is now shipping. Uh, and it wasn't for a while, as I mentioned, that there was a, a delay. And so the community is growing rapidly right now. There's a bunch of new people uh, coming in and uh, pumping a lot of new energy into the community. Uh, I'm really excited to see it. If you order one now, uh, the current estimate, I think, is October. If you were to order now, you'd get it in October. So uh, they, they are finally uh, turning them out. The FPGA was the hardest chip to get, obviously. It's a... Uh, uh, in small quantities. <clears throat> I'm going to just spin through a couple of screenshots here. I'm not really going to talk a whole lot about it. This is the basic environment, very familiar, 80 columns, uh, but Petsky font. It's a really, really fun, welcoming thing. Uh, there are uh, a bunch of games written for it already. You can kind of get a sense of the full color graphics uh, from these stills. Uh, these are actually, these two titles are available as boxed software. You can buy them and order them, and you get a fun little box with a floppy disk and everything. These are at the table downstairs if you want to look at them. Uh, more games currently in development, and uh, you can see uh, kind of a, a sense of what you can download and play with today. Uh, demos are also very popular to do this, a very popular demo machine. Uh, just learning about all the capabilities and pushing it to its limits uh, has been a, a lot of fun. And uh, tools, people are building tools for it. Uh, I really like the 80 columns uh, for doing on-device development and uh, other things. So tool building is really fun as well. We've even got some hardware accessories people like to make. You can get a four-port joystick adapter, you can get a dust cover, uh, things like that. As I mentioned, it comes with a printed user's guide with a full basic reference, so it's everything you need to get started. Uh, the user's guide is actually a fraction of our documentation. This is one of the best documented open source projects I've ever seen. Um, there are about 1,400 pages of documentation if you try to print it all out in this format. Um, uh, a lot of it uh, is still in progress. Uh, it's a, a big project that as the current doc lead, I'm very interested in uh, pushing the boundary on this and getting this uh, into a finished state where we can maybe do a, a full print run of like a set of manuals or something. We'll do a Kickstarter and you can buy a box set of a, a Mega 65 documentation in a, of a printable form. We have an emulator. You can, uh, it's free. You can download it, run it on your PC if you can't afford a Mega 65 or, or not sure if you want to buy one yet. Uh, you can just run the emulator and get um, uh, most of the same experience. That FPGA core means you can, or the FPGA layer means you can install alternate cores. Um, a core is just like a chipset. Uh, it's like an all new computer. You can upload a new computer to it and it will just work. The best one right now is a Commodore 64 core. It's a very highly compatible Commodore 64 implementation based on the Mr. Core, if you're familiar with the uh, Mr. platform. Uh, it's got lots of great features and it's the best way to run Commodore 64 software on a Mega 65. Um, I have a lot of hope that uh, we will build this out into a library of 
all the Commodore 8 bits so that the Mega 65 can be this really versatile way of recreating the entire Commodore 8 bit line. It's like, uh, I think, very uh, a compelling idea, particularly for the keyboard layout, because all the Commodores have kind of a custom, you know, special <coughs> keyboard layout um, for all these cores to use. I think would be really cool. Uh, you can also play arcade games. Uh, somebody's porting a bunch of arcade cores uh, to it, so it's the actual arcade chipset, the actual arcade uh, ROM software for a bunch of arcade games running on a Mega 65. Uh, there's a Game Boy core, as the X Spectrum core. You can just convert it into these other computers pretty easily. We have a website uh, where people upload the things that they're working on, and uh, it's just a community website, so that you can get all your stuff. You can get your firmware updates, uh, but you can also <coughs> get games and everything else that people have posted. Uh, we have some great PC tools also uh, for that uh, Ethernet file transfer I mentioned and some other things for writing software is really uh, interesting. Um, I'm just one person of uh, many, it takes many, many people to put together a, a project like this. Uh, lots of people have uh, come and gone through the project over the years. It's been 10 years. Um, these are just the people that are credited in the user manual, and, and there are so many, many people uh, outside of that that have uh, worked on things. They've either just developed their own projects and contributed to the community, or they've uh, contributed to the open source parts of making the chipset better, or the documentation better, uh, or the operating system better. And uh, uh, so I'm you know, just a small piece of this. Um, I don't want to minimize any of their efforts by only talking about the things I've worked on uh, for, for the rest of today, uh, but um, I'm just going to sort of focus on that because I want to talk about uh, things that I've learned about, you know, uh, uh, working on a, a project like this. Um, I really did not expect to get so deeply involved in this when I got my Mega 65. I really thought it would just be an opportunity to learn a little bit of assembly language and write a game or two and kind of that would be it. Um, and uh, it's been so gratifying that they've been welcoming to me to join the team and get more involved and, and things like that. So I'm going to talk about that. If you think about the Mega 65 as a platform that people can use to you know, learn and uh, uh, explore and uh, uh, play with things, uh, that platform kind of consists of these pieces, or this is the kind of work that goes in, into developing the Mega 65 platform. Uh, again, there are many projects outside of this circle that uh, qualifies as a, a part of the Mega 65, but I wanted to focus on these. Uh, I've mostly been uh, working in these areas. Um, and it, this really requires a diverse set of skills and experience. Like, you need a lot of different people coming in who are passionate about different things. Somebody who's really interested in working on the hardware may not care about the operating system that much, or vice versa. Um, somebody who is really interested in um, a, a system software and tools, maybe they're not so interested in testing or community building or some of these other things. And so uh, having a lot of people come together with a diverse uh, skill set uh, is really essential for making a project like this work. Uh, when I first got my Mega 65, I, I noticed it was pretty early on, like the, the first batch went out, and there were a bunch of rough edges uh, to the experience. Um, you kind of had to be a little bit nerdy and a little bit patient to get through it and set it up and figure out, okay, well, this part isn't really done yet. We're going to work on this. Uh, um, I'll work around it doing this, that, and the other thing. And I just started, like a lot of people who got their Mega 65s in 2022, I just started taking notes about, okay, this is what it took for me to do that. Um, and I ended up assembling this, thinking this would be like a blog post or something like that. And I ended up writing uh, the Mega 65 Welcome Guide um, with a bunch of information in it and sort of welcoming people. Uh, this is how you uh, set things up. This is how you get started uh, to uh, you know, work around those rough edges. I wanted everyone to have a really good um, uh, early experience. And so it addresses a lot of the gaps in the very first batch of machines, some of them hardware related, some of them related to the firmware or the software, uh, many of which have since been fixed. Uh, so that's uh, kind of interesting. The welcome guide is almost out of date at this point. I've been trying to keep it up to date. But it ended up being about 17,000 words and 80 images, and then somebody asked me to make a PDF version and it printed to 108 pages. So it's, a, it's actually a bit of a, a booklet. Um, I did not expect it to, to get that large, but uh, um, it, it kind of worked out that way. Um, I really like that it was a website. I know somebody asked uh, for a PDF, so I made one. But making this a web resource was really important in the early days of the project. Uh, they had kind of an old-fashioned way of thinking of documentation. Most of the documentation is a PDF that you download. Uh, and uh, a lot of the uh, institutional knowledge is captured on Discord, which isn't really on the web, and so it's really hard to find. 
Uh, and uh, so having a, an actual web resource, I thought, was a, a really important uh, contributor, especially in the early days when people, I just got this thing and I don't know about it and I'm going to Google and searching for information uh, about it. Uh, the web as a platform is a bit of a hot topic right now in terms of uh, uh, you know, using Google to find information and so forth, but uh, I still believe in the web and uh, consider it to be important. Uh, moreover, I really think that uh, this was important for the early days to write down the things that they couldn't put in the print manual. You don't want to write down all your bugs in a print book, right? What you want the book to describe is the ideal experience, and then you help people get around the bugs as you fix them, fix them and stuff. So this could be a living document that uh, keeps track of what bugs are fixed, what workarounds are still necessary, and whatnot. So I was keeping this up to date for, for, for a couple of years. Of course, now we have a new version of the main board that fixes some of the electrical problems of the first version. They're all pretty minor. The first uh, version of the Mega 65 is still a really solid machine, uh, but we had the opportunity to fix it, so we fixed it. Uh, we're up to release 096 uh, by now that has a bunch of uh, chipset and operating system uh, fixes and improvements. Uh, we've also produced a, a second edition of the user's guide. So all of the extensions and new features we've added to the basic, um, a lot of the new features like the Ethernet file transfer are now described in the user's guide that weren't even a thing in the first version. So uh, there's a new version of the user's guide uh, to cover that stuff as well. Uh, and I'm happy to say most of the welcome guide got folded in to uh, the user's guide. Um, so a, a couple of sort of key takeaways that, that I pulled from the welcome guide project um, is that idea of an evolving platform needs living documentation. Uh, it's pretty you know, essential. I, mean, I think you could treat the PDFs as living documentation, but then you end up with multiple copies on people's hard drives and so forth. So having a, a web resource was really important. And search engine optimization matters. I think if you want to be findable, if you want people who are only casually interested in what you're working on, uh, to be able to uh, uh, figure out what you're about and connect with your project. Uh, you need resources on the web and you need to use the handful of tricks that are required to uh, participate in the web ecosystem. Uh, it's really easy without uh, just that handful of uh, web development best practices to accidentally hide all your stuff, even if you're, they're on the web somewhere. If search engines aren't finding them, if search engines aren't promoting them to people, returning them in, uh, in response to actual you know, searches, uh, then it's you know, you're on the dark web, basically. The, the, you're not actually uh, there. So uh, uh, using just a little bit of SEO, making sure you're using good URLs and uh, 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 making sure you're getting indexed and things like that is really important. Uh, so yeah, so the documentation, uh, I already mentioned this part, uh, lots of documentation to work on. It's a LaTeX project. Uh, it's very large. Uh, it's got some great stuff in it. Um, uh, uh, really useful tables, excellent resource for the new CPU and all the registers and the hardware, uh, things like that. Uh, the user's guide was especially well polished. This was before my time, like the first version of the user's guide. Uh, there was another set of technical writers that really uh, worked that into something that was worth printing and uh, they did an excellent job. All the PDFs are online. Uh, so uh, uh, those many previous contributors you know, they totaled about 1,400 pages so far across multiple volumes. Um, I ended up in my tenure adding about 100 pages of new material, and I'm still going. This is kind of the tip of the iceberg for what is left to do. Um, and I did some extensive editing of the existing material. Uh, so I was you know, rewriting, reorganizing, polishing a, a lot of the stuff that was already there. And I continue to do this. This is a, a very large project that continues. Um, as the documentation lead, I uh, also took the existing style guide, the previous tech writers put together a style guide for this project. and uh, so I have been enhancing it and growing it as needed to accommodate the rest of the documentation. And that second edition uh, was um, largely my work. I did uh, uh, do a lot of rewriting in the user's guide to account for the new features and organize it better. Um, uh, and uh, uh, for the people that have the first edition, which is still a lot of people because the first edition is still being bundled with the machine, uh, I set this up as a print-on-demand. So if you uh, want a second edition user's guide, you can get one pretty inexpensively. Uh, this was a, 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 a because print-on-demand makes it so that anyone can have one, and I don't really we don't have to do like pre-ordering of that or do large batch printing or anything like that. There are some trade-offs to that, but uh, uh, it was worth it, I think, just to say, hey, if you have a first edition, you should upgrade. 
Uh, this is also a great opportunity for people who are using that emulator and don't actually own the Mega 65 but still want to play with it to have a printed book to go along with it. I've been astounded how people have really embraced the emulator as a Mega 65 substitute. They've gotten a lot out of it. They've developed a huge amount of software for the Mega 65 without even owning one. And uh, so I'm excited that they could potentially have a user's guide to go with it. And that is itself a great way to get engaged uh, with the project. So uh, I would say for documentation, um, some of these are pretty uh, standard advice for tech writers, uh, but it really does apply in these cases. There were some uh, really interesting ways to apply these concepts to the Mega 65 documentation. Uh, knowing your audience, very important for writing, especially technical writing, like what is their technical level, what is their interest, what angle are they coming in with, what is their background and experience. Uh, but this was especially interesting for the Mega 65 documentation because the audience changed. The audience changed actually quite substantially when they released the machine. This was a 10-year project, remember, so there were a bunch of contributors you know, that were there and present before the machine shipped. And for them, they needed documentation to figure out how to work with all of the sort of crazy tools and edge cases and incompleteness of the, the, the thing so they could navigate it and learn how to contribute to it and fill it in. And uh, so a lot of the documentation up to that point was not really targeted at end users that would buy it in a box and get it home and, and play with it. It was targeted more like hardcore uh, technical uh, uh, involved in getting involved in contributing to the project. Uh, really good stuff, it was really important for them at the time, but it was a different audience. Uh, and so a lot of the rewriting that I did, especially in the user's guide, was to sort of refocus the project on the people you know, getting it and maybe they're only casually interested, maybe they're not, don't consider themselves programmers, but they want to dabble in it or something like that. It's a, a very different group of people. Respect what came before. This comes up a lot in software engineering, uh, in professional software engineering. Uh, and in software engineering, this is largely about resisting the temptation when you like join a new team and the previous team has left. Uh, uh, the people who built the thing are no longer there. And it's your job to say, okay, I've got this thing that exists, uh, that's, uh, all this code that I don't understand and my manager wants me to change it. They want me to make a change. I think it would be easier if I just throw it all away and build a new thing, right? Um, it's very tempting to do that because you feel like, well, I'm, I'm optimistic that I vaguely understand this problem space. I'm going to build a new thing um, uh, that completely replaces the old thing. And what you're doing is you're throwing out the company's institutional knowledge. Like all the things that the company has learned, the previous team has learned, is all built into that messy code base that is really hard to understand. And so really just throwing it out is you're throwing away the most valuable part of the company when you do that. Uh, uh, thankfully, that in a professional setting, uh, that decision can usually be made by business goals. Like the business wants you to do something so you can sort of decide, okay, what do I do with this code base um, uh, based on the business goals? And you don't really have to think about the, uh, uh, the way anyone might feel about their work being thrown away. I've been developing software for 25 years and all of it has been thrown away at some point, I'm sure, so I can't be too emotionally attached to it. Um, in, a, in an open source hobby project, Personal feelings do enter into it a little bit, and I think that's okay uh, to say that, look, I spent a lot of effort into this. You can't just come in and throw all my stuff away, and uh, uh, that needs to be accounted for. And I think the strategy is the same in both cases. Whenever possible, involve the previous contributors in your decision making. And say, hey, look, get by and ask them, to say, is this a good idea? I think this needs to be changed in this way. This is uh, uh, what needs to happen here. And uh, uh, so a, a lot of that happens in uh, the uh, uh, open source world as well. And you do have to take people's sort of personal investment into account when uh, navigating that. Um, t plus the technical writing too, right? Like uh, I, I feel like my writing is always better than everyone else's writing. That's just a fact. And, uh, um, and it's, of course, it's not a fact. It's uh, my personal perspective, but it feels like a fact when I'm in the, in the moment. And I'm just going to rewrite everybody's stuff. And uh, it's better to learn how to reuse people's stuff. Um, uh, which is really directly related to this next point. Style is mostly arbitrary. A lot of the things that we think about in uh, technical writing, I've got strong opinions about how things should be written. It's not the way I would write it, so it's wrong. 
um, uh, a lot of these decisions, even though they feel based in some kind of logic or cultural perspective or something like that, most of those opinions that come out of that framework are equally valid to everyone else's. And so if there's already an existing style, use it. Don't try to you know, revise it unnecessarily. Um, uh, moreover, encode that style in a style guide so you don't have to fight with everybody uh, when it comes time to actually uh, decide how something should be written or phrased or, uh, or, or designed. Um, uh, there are two contrasting examples uh, I have uh, for this. Uh, one is that we use British spelling for this project. Somebody at some point decided that we use British spelling. That's not the decision I would have made, uh, because I'm not British, uh, but also because the thing we're documenting isn't British either. <laughs> um, the, uh, uh, the, the Commodore operating system, the APIs, they all spell color, C-O-L-O-R. And so it's a little bit weird that we, the, name, the word color as a concept is spelled C-O-L-O-U-R in our documentation when it's sitting right next to an API name that's C-O-L-O-R. Um, but that is not a big, problem. Like, it's fine uh, that somebody made that decision. Uh, and just because I would have done it differently doesn't mean I should go in and change it and do a find and replace um, uh, on all the British spelling. Uh, so that stays. We are, continue to use British spelling. Um, but as a contrasting example, at some point somebody decided and put a lot of effort into um, uh, designing the print version so that a code sample uh, prints in Petsky font. If you're looking at uh, you know, source code, in the manual or, or, or something like that. Um, it'll be white text on a black background and the, an 80 column Petsky font, which is really small and skinny. And I find really, really difficult to read, both in print and on screen. And uh, it kind of worked out okay in the users of the guide for the basic reference. It's fine there for the most part. But as you get into like assembly language where everything is three letters uh, long and, and all in sort of skinny columns and stuff, it was really hard. So um, I uh, tried to socialize that change as best as I could. I sort of pre-announced this is my intention, this is why I'm doing it. Uh, here is an example of the before and after. Uh, we have a steering committee now, so I talked to the steering committee and said, hey, we'll get those opinions before I go to the wider community and say, I'm going to change the way we we render code samples. So um, uh, that, that change is still in progress, but nobody seemed to mind in the end. So uh, I'm going forward with it. Um, yeah. Uh, oh, and I, I guess I would add to that uh, if you really care about style, uh, work your way into the project to become the doc lead, and then you get to write the style guide. Uh, so that, that it all works in your favor. Um, a budget for layout, test prints, technical issues. Whenever you're doing documentation, you can't just send text into a a black hole and hope it comes out the best. It's a manufactured product, especially if you're doing print. Um, uh, so you need to treat it like one. And, uh, it's like you know, getting the plastic cases right or getting the, the circuit boards right. You have to get the technical documentation to look good and you do need to test it. Um, it's a LaTeX project. LaTeX is hard. Um, uh, I like LaTeX a lot, um, but that's a personality defect. Um, uh, uh, so build often. There's a, a trick if you're working on a new chapter uh, that you're adding to something. Uh, and, and it's an existing book with 50 chapters in it, uh, don't just put the chapter in the, in the book and, and build it. Uh, create a new book um, that consists just of the chapter you're working on. It's a much faster build cycle. It's easier to find errors, things like that. It's a little, it's a little tip. So the Mega 65 ROM, uh, I like to describe it in three parts. It is the kernel of the operating system. It is the basic interpreter, and it's the screen editor application, the, the thing that you see with the ready prompt and the blinking cursor on that. Um, it is the heart of the computer. It's the first thing uh, that the CPU sees when it turns on. Uh, and uh, 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 it's, uh, it's a, the basis of most programming projects. Most programming projects will either be written in basic or they will use the kernel in some way. Uh, it is possible to write a program that completely disables the kernel, replaces the ROM with its own code, and so forth. But um, uh, 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 our ROM is based on the Commodore 65 code. is written on 100% in assembly language. Um, I did not know assembly language when I uh, first joined this project, or maybe I did a little bit, but I don't actually remember ever having done anything substantial in uh, assembly language uh, at the time. So it was very new for me. I didn't think I would be actually uh, working on the ROM at all. Um, obviously, this was a huge effort by the previous team to, to, to do fix fixes and uh, uh, finish the thing, extend it in, again, error-appropriate ways uh, that were considered uh, fun uh, uh, opportunities uh, by the community. Um, and I got to a point, there was a, a, a thing that I noticed that has been true for me for all Commodores for my entire life, where um, the home key is right next to the backspace key, the delete key. 
And whenever I would type and I would make a typing mistake and I would hit delete, I would almost inevitably, <laughs> maybe about 20% you know, of the time, accidentally hit the home key. And this would send my cursor soaring up to the uh, upper left corner of the screen. And of course, if you're writing a basic program or something, that cursor was probably in the lower right of the screen somewhere. And so now I have to like move the cursor down and over to get back to where I was. And it's just, this, this one little typing error made, is always super frustrating. And I was especially doing this as an adult when I have better typing skills now and so forth, uh, uh, that uh, I was doing it all the time. And I said, is there something we can do about this? And I sort of looked at the existing feature set of the uh, screen editor uh, at the time, and uh, the, starting with the Commodore 128, the screen editor got pretty fancy. There's like cool stuff you can do to navigate the cursor and move around, but it didn't really have a good way to solve this problem. And it seemed like it would be a nice addition to have a way to just undo accidentally hitting the home keys. There's something I could do about that. And so I proposed a feature uh, where I could do that, and uh, the, the team at the time that was working on the ROM, the, 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 the tech lead at the time for the ROM said, sure, go ahead, do it. And I was like, oh, okay. And so I opened up the ROM code and said, okay, well, I'll have to figure out where this goes. And I kind of figured out this feature and I uh, wrote it and I submitted it. Um, and now uh, if you accidentally hit the home key on Omega 65, you can hit escape and then home and it'll put the cursor back where it was. It's a huge lifesaver. I use it all the time. I love telling people about it. It's like this great addition of things. Um, it was also, I hate to exaggerate this, but it was exhilarating to contribute a feature to the Commodore ROM lineage. Like, I just added a feature that I've always wanted since I was a small child <laughs> to the Commodore, and, uh, uh, and and now it's there, and it's there for everyone to use. And, like, it was, it was just mind-blowing. And so I was kind of hooked at that point, and I've been a ROM developer ever since. Um, I'm now uh, uh, in a, a lead role on the ROM. I, I sort of maintain it, and I uh, do bug fixes and, and things. Um, uh, uh, API management, API evolution is a passion of mine. I, I really I feel strongly about uh, the ROM being something that other programs can depend on. And so that requires a certain set of disciplines and skills, uh, testing, documentation, community outreach. Like if you want to make a change to the thing that everyone's using, you want to be able to talk to everybody and say, uh, is this going to be a safe change? Is this going to work with your program? Uh, testing in particular, like uh, I put a huge amount of effort into uh, testing the existing software that people have written for the Mega 65. Uh, people upload all their stuff to that file host website I mentioned. And so I just keep a local copy of everything everyone has ever uploaded to file host. And I use a Python script that remote controls my Mega 65 that can run through uh, dozens and dozens of titles to make sure that they all work uh, as uh, I'm making changes to this platform. Um, I really saw that my contribution to this would actually be documentation, but I also consider that to be why I'm here doing ROM maintenance also. Um, I want the ROM to work, I want to make sure it's stable, and then it's also fully documented for people. So, all very important. In my tenure alone, we've uh, fixed over 111 bugs and, uh, and, and made improvements. Um, this is just in the last two years. Uh, it doesn't count all the, you know, probably hundreds of, uh, of fixes and improvements that have been made uh, by previous ROM developers. So, um, if you want to start like this, start small. <laughs> um, I, I went in not really knowing anything about the technology, and uh, it was a big, intimidating code base. Lots of vi it's not just assembly language, it's vintage assembly language. Uh, it doesn't even use features of modern assemblers, no macros or anything. Um, it's a really simple, um, a straightforward code base, like three or four giant files. Um, and uh, so start small, start somewhere. Like pick something, like undo home or something like that to, uh, to do that. And learn as you go. You don't uh, have, to, have to know everything uh, to get started. This is going to come up again later in the talk. But, um, and uh, use your tools, especially debuggers. Um, you can only get so far with print-style debugging. I don't mind print-style debugging. Uh, I, programmers in the audience probably know what I'm, I mean by that. If you have a problem uh, and you say, I don't know why the computer thinks it is the way this is at this point, so I'm going to add a print statement that will just like just write out some kind of message about what the current state of the computer is at this moment. Um, everybody does it, no shame in it, um, but uh, there are better tools available. And when you're doing something like low-level ROM programming, you don't have every opportunity to do like print-style debugging. You don't have log files, you don't have a console necessarily. You can kind of write to the screen a little bit if you're, if you're for daring, but if you're, you're troubleshooting this boot startup sequence, there's nothing to write to. 
uh, on, a, on a microcomputer, a vintage microcomputer. Uh, we do have some excellent debugger uh, uh, tools, and they're, they're worth learning how to use. So the ROM, super complicated uh, assembly language, uh, more than I ever expected to get involved with. Um, I sure as heck did not expect to do anything involving the Mega 65 FPGA core. That is like dark magic, <laughs> super complicated. It's, a, it's an all new language, an all new programming paradigm that I had no, no idea uh, anything about. And there were experts on the team that were super good at it. I was just going to defer to them to do a lot of these things. This FPGA core implements the CPU, the VIC chip, the SIDs, the device controllers, and all that stuff. It all ends up living on that one little square right there. You can see it. I've got a, a main board downstairs on the table if you want to look at what a, an FPGA chip looks like. Um, it's implemented in a language called VHDL. Verilog is a, another one. These are very old languages. They've been used for chip design for a very long time. Uh, in fact, the Commodore 65 chips were written in Verilog originally. We don't have that source. Uh, we, uh, uh, Paul basically reconstructed this uh, uh, from, uh, in VHDL from a specification document and uh, uh, some general knowledge. Um, we do have some Verilog in our own source code, though. There are a couple of extra components that were added. Um, when it comes to adding features to the core, uh, we, we still do this occasionally, but we're pretty judicious about it. I, I, there was a, uh, Paul had a vision for the chipset, um, extended video features, um, additional sound features, things like that. And that's pretty much all sketched out and implemented. It's a, a nice feature set. But we still consider every once in a while um, whether, we, when we have a problem with the, the platform, is it worth implementing it as F, in FPGA or in the ROM? Uh, the ROM, uh, you know, there are advantages and disadvantages to doing this in, in the ROM, but it's like really tempting. We can invent new chips. We can just create hardware to solve these problems. And if, if we can do that, why don't we? Um, and so any given problem looks like, hey, can we just like, put this and, like make an all new chip just to solve this one problem? Um, and so, so our litmus test for this is like hardware acceleration. Like, is it, is it going to be so challenging for the operating system to solve this problem that it has to be done? Uh, and it's, so like timing issues, uh, uh, you know, serial interfacing, uh, stuff like that. Uh, there was a feature request, uh, again, go, kind of going back to typing quality as, a, as an adult when I have uh, uh, typing things, but I, I, um, I also had problems typing on Commodore 64 as a kid. And when I got the Mega 65, it was very nostalgic. The typing experience felt exactly like Commodore 64, um, in both good ways and bad. Um, like I could tell that as I was typing, it would like forget, it would like miss some of my keystrokes. And they were the exact same keystrokes as when I was a child. It's like <laughs> they fit my finger memory perfectly. And I was like, what? how could that be? Um, and it's actually pretty easy to explain. It's the same hardware and the same software. So even though it's this fancy new mechanical keyboard with a 40 megahertz processor and all this other stuff, they recreated the CIA chip that reads the keyboard. And so uh, with all the flaws of that mechanism. And the keyboard scanning happens in the ROM code mostly. Uh, like w once every uh, 50 or 60 times per second, the uh, ROM uh, asks the CIA chip, they switch it over, okay, tell me what key is currently being pressed right now on the keyboard. The CIA tries to report it, and then the operating system says, okay, I'll put that in a buffer and, and it'll show up on the screen or whatever. Um, and uh, 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 when you type really quickly on a keyboard, um, it, we don't notice it on a modern machine, but uh, we always uh, end up hitting another key before we've released the previous key. And the CIA chip doesn't handle that very well. It's just the, the technology is a little bit too old for that. Um, uh, so uh, I did file a feature request for this. I said, look, I'm you know, mo modern typist. I feel like we could really make this a better machine if we improve the, the keyboard uh, experience. And uh, uh, so I did not start this feature. Uh, uh, Paul started it, and the, the, the scanning committee discussed it and tried to figure out what's the right way to do this, should we do this. And they decided, OK, let's go ahead and do this. Um, and uh, so he implemented, started an implementation of a hardware accelerated keyboard scanner. Um, that uh, the hardware itself maintains a little bit of a keyboard buffer. It handles key repeat and all this other stuff that the ROM normally does. Um, but they never finished it. They started down this path and it just wasn't a high priority and so forth. And so after many months, I said, look, what was the status of that? And they said, well, you know, we, we just don't have the resources to finish this feature. And so I said, can I, can I finish it? And uh, so I got my hands dirty and I opened up the VHDL. And, I, and thankfully, this was a lot easier. I don't want to exaggerate this too much. It's not a terrible language to start with, but also he had already started, Paul had already written a 
lot of it. And uh, so I could easily go in and fix bugs and, and things like that. Um, but it was a huge learning process. The team was really supportive of me sort of figuring out how to uh, develop a feature uh, for the core. And so uh, starting in one of the most recent uh, platform releases, you can now get a much uh, more accurate typing experience for faster typing. Uh, I also uh, did some work on the char fit character attributes. I won't talk about that too much, but I, I did try to extend this into doing more things. Uh, we're currently working on uh, improving uh, the IEC serial port stuff. Um, that's The timing of that is really hard to get right in the ROM, especially if you've got a faster CPU, and it's just a little bit different. Um, I'm actually, haven't done any work on this. There's a different ROM uh, contributor. Wayne uh, is doing a lot of the ROM side, and Paul has been working on the hardware side for that, and that's going to be really exciting to, to button that up and, and get really good support for IEC devices. Um, so again, learn by doing. Uh, like, there was just no way I could learn all of VHDL in the amount of time I had to work on this feature, but thankfully I was able to learn just enough uh, to uh, work on this feature and, and get the keyboard scanner finished, especially uh, learning uh, from example. Um, you don't need to know everything to do something. I have to remind myself of this every day of my life. Uh, I'm the kind of person that wants to buy 50 books on a subject before I even try something. And uh, uh, it's uh, the, the best engineers I know know this you know, to heart. Um, Paul is one of them. I, I, Paul is somebody who can dive into a project and just get his hands dirty, learn just enough. You know, don't try to learn everything. Learn just enough to solve the problem you're trying to solve. Um, uh, and like, I've worked with a bunch of great engineers in my career, um, and they all just dive in and, and, and learn it as they go. Um, they don't sort of fetishize expertise. They just you know, learn what they need to know. Um, work on improving your workflow. Uh, I won't talk about this too much, but I, I do, as an engineer, always reserve like a day a month uh, to look over, look over all the things I did in the last month and what was frustrating, what, like, what, what took too long, too long, what could I fix with writing a script or just learning the keystrokes of my editor or something like that, right? Um, just in, in, invest in yourself, invest in, in your area. And in this case, uh, I was using an old laptop for core builds that it was taking like 20 minutes to build the core. And it was just too long for me to iterate and, and fix, fix things. So I spent a bunch of money. <laughs> and I, and I, I built a PC with the fastest available CPU, and now my core build times are six minutes, and it was totally worth it. So um, um, it's worth doing that. At some point, I got like a, a coffee mug with the 6502 assembly language instruction set on it. And it was really useful. Um, there's a, a, at least one company online that, that sells those. And uh, I, I thought, well, that would be cool to make coffee mugs for the Mega 65. And uh, I started working on a design for it. And I realized that the Mega 65 CPU has twice as many instructions as a 6502. And I couldn't get it to fit on a single coffee mug. It would have had to, you know, it would have been too small to actually read and use. I would have needed two coffee mugs. I considered yeah. just doing two coffee mugs on my desk. But I ended up reworking it into a mouse pad design and uh, setting this up with another print on demand service for anyone that would want one. I figured the market for this is pretty small, so I didn't want to print a batch of 100. Um, and uh, the same, I just used Zazzle. I don't know if you know, you know Zazzle. Um, they also make posters available, so I just took the same design. So yeah, I make a poster out of it. Maybe somebody will like that. Both of these are downstairs if you want to look at them, and I can uh, hook you up if you want to order one. Um, uh, they're pretty cool. Um, I also got involved uh, a little bit this way. Um, this is just a little bit of a story of how um, you know, going into this with technical expertise, you feel like, oh, these problems are easy to solve. And uh, uh, we had an issue with the early batches of the Mega 65. The Mega 65 has a real-time clock on it. It'll remember what the time of day is, the time and date uh, is, and that's useful for the SD card and some other features. Um, and there was a small percentage of the first batch of Mega 65s where the real-time clock was broken. It was not holding its time. It wasn't uh, telling the time correctly. And uh, you know, we don't have, this is not a big production, so we can't replace everybody's boards. So this is like way too expensive. And so we wanted a way to sort of resolve this issue for people that even cared about it. It wasn't clear if anybody really cared about it, but it was kind of, you know, it's a sore thumb to, to, to have a, a broken feature of, of the board for a small percentage of people. Uh, again, I'll give Paul the credit for actually doing the real fix. He found this 
part on AliExpress on this little breakout board. Um, and if you take a, uh, one of these Grove connector wires and plug it into here, he upgraded the core uh, so that if the core would say, hey, if this thing is connected to this port over here, use this for the real-time clock instead of the one that's on the board. It's just a little workaround, pretty inexpensive. Um, these are dirt cheap. These are relatively inexpensive. But you do have to buy the cables in packs of five. So with shipping, you're paying 20 bucks, and you get a bunch of extra wi wires as a result, and you have to do a little bit of soldering. Um, it's the easiest soldering project in the world if you want to learn how to solder. The, getting these four wires connected is <laughs> a great place to start. Uh, but um, I still kind of felt a little off about that because I had this vision of a Mega 65 user that didn't own solder. Right? Um, I wanted people to feel good about this machine without having to crack it open and, and solder things and, and treat this like an electronics project. Um, so um, I, I built off of Paul's work there. Uh, to uh, get this, and instead of making just one for myself, I made 50 of them. And uh, just made them available to the community, and I advertised, sort of set up a program, I put up a form saying, if you want one, get send me your address, and we'll work out the shipping costs, and I'll send it to you. Um, it's been reasonably successful. I'm glad I did this. Only about 30 people actually wanted one in the end. Uh, it was, it's totally not clear if that's like all the people that were ever affected by this issue, or if that's just all the people that cared. Um, a lot of people didn't even notice. Quite frankly, a lot of people that bought Mega 65s put them in their closet and didn't actually use them for anything. So they may not have noticed that. They may not even know that this replacement real-time clock was available. All fine. Um, I don't uh, care about that part, but I do want to make sure that everyone who wants one has one. So if you have an old Mega 65 and know this is issue, but um, if you're going to do the hardware projects like this, you want like a physical product that you're going to send out. Um, spend some time researching and testing shipping logistics. Uh, including packaging. I did not come up with a satisfying solution for sending out these little chips. Like, it seemed like that would be the easiest thing to send. It's a tiny little thing, but I didn't want them to break, so I put them in a little cardboard box. But if it's in a little cardboard box, then the USPS will treat it as a package and not a, not a letter. You, know, you can't trick USPS that way. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, shipping to Germany is expensive. Ship, uh, shipping a teeny tiny box with this tiny little part um, from my home in Seattle to an address in Germany is $18. Yeah. And, <laughs> and I've never been satisfied with that. I don't know if there's a better way to do this. If somebody knows uh, a better way to do this, let me know. Um, the most we came up with is I eventually found something in Germany to act as a shipping relay. Um, so I could pay $18 one time for a larger box and send them 20 of these. And then whenever I got uh, somebody in Germany that wanted one, I would just forward the address and they would figure it out for $5 or whatever it was. So uh, that's the best we could do on a small scale, I think. I would use a fulfillment service, a European fulfillment service, or something for a larger product or something. Um, uh, the pr uh, print-on-demand versus bulk manufacturing, you do. There's a little bit of a quality trade-off when you do print-on-demand. You get fewer options, and you don't get as much control over the final product. Um, I am like considering just as a, on a lark, buying a hundred mouse pads from a different company just to see <laughs> if I can get a, a higher quality mouse pad out of it. But I think. All the people that would ever want that mouse pad already has one, so I don't know if I, maybe I'll just like give them out, like I'll just, you know, spend the money and I have them as a, as a giveaway for conferences like this one. Um, another thing I noticed uh, early on uh, is that a lot of people who pre-ordered the Mega 65, I mean, you know the story, I kind of alluded to it already. Um, uh, there was a huge rush of pre-orders at the beginning, and then about half of them got fulfilled right away, and the other half got delayed by two years. Um, the, that's terrible on its own, but what was worse about that is that we couldn't reach anybody. We could not tell them what the shipping status was. And so we had hundreds of pretty frustrated people who had <laughs> spent some money and are not only have to wait two years, but don't hear anything from us at all. And there was a reason for that. Uh, we used a, a shipping, a manufacturing and a fulfillment partner, a Trans Electronic, who's excellent. They, they've been great to work with. But they normally deal with um, electronics industry uh, uh, fulfillment. And uh, so they don't have like a mechanism for sending email updates to people who have pre-ordered and things like that. Uh, moreover, they are constrained by German privacy laws that they are not allowed to share with us our own mailing lists. The, all those people that pre-ordered, we have no idea who they are, we're hmm. not allowed to know their email addresses. Um, we have to reach them some other way. All we can do is stand on the internet and shout, hey, over here, and hope that they will. That enough of them will eventually find us. Um, and so that's what this was. This was me standing up on the internet and shouting, hey, over here, look at this. 
Uh, I want to make sure everyone who cares about this project uh, um, uh, uh, can uh, get some regular information about it. There's a monthly newsletter uh, where we could talk about the shipping status, but also all the cool things that people are doing with it, uh, promoting other people's projects, uh, it changes to the firmware, if there's new firmware available. Um, and to really juice this up, I started writing feature articles uh, to, to go with it on uh, programming subjects. I kind of mentioned that. Um, so this became uh, the official uh, news source for uh, Mega65. That's when I joined the steering committee, I was kind of their scribe for this. I was going to be the, the way to disseminate this information to a larger audience. Um, and, but I put my name on it, and I did that on purpose because uh, um, I was a little bit self-conscious about being the official voice of this project at that point. I, I was kind of early in my uh, my tenure at the time. And so I said, look, I, I'll, I'll retain some editorial control. I'll put my name on it so it's not really official. Uh, um, it'll just be this kind of thing on the side. So if I make, make a mistake, if I say something wrong about the project, it'll be on me and not like a, a, a problem that the entire team has to deal with. Um, that's the only reason my name is on the thing. But I have enjoyed the freedom of uh, sort of sprucing up the newsletter and using my own voice and things like that. Um, I really wanted to make this interactive. I was, the, the editorial focus for the newsletter is interactivity. And uh, uh, I wanted there to be something in every newsletter that you could sit down and try. Even if you don't touch your Mega 65 all month, by the time the newsletter shows up, flip it on, spend 15 minutes, you've got some instructions, and learn something cool, and, and, and that at least gets you something out of it, even if you don't have time to really mess with the rest of it. Um, uh, I was, it's just like a, a thing in the back of my mind. I really didn't like the idea of people keeping their Mega 65s in closets. I, I wanted to give, give people excuses to, to bring it out and do something with it. And so um, I covered a lot of different uh, topics, adventure gaming, character graphics, SID music, sprites, digitized audio, getting started, basic programming, assembly language programming, also some advanced topics. Uh, recently I did some issues on interrupts, it's a, 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 an advanced CPU concept in kernel programming, things like that. I, I'm really trying to pump energy into it, like the, this flywheel of a project like this where you have a bunch of users that are building things and that gets more users excited and more people into the project. I wanted to like kind of pump that flywheel a little bit during this early lull uh, while people were still waiting for their the Mega 65s to get delivered. I ended up with, um, so far I've got 24 issues and over 100,000 words. Um, if you do the math on that, um, uh, uh, I don't know, do people really want to read 4,000 words in an email uh, uh, once a month? It's, it's, they're, they end up being kind of long. Uh, uh, Gmail has a cutoff limit, of, of like a byte count, um, and uh, a Substack will tell you once you've hit that limit so you don't write too long a thing. And all of, all, of my, all of my newsletters go past that limit. And so Substack is always yelling at me, saying, hey, it's too long for Gmail, too long for Gmail. It's fine. You just say show entire message at the bottom. It's, it's not actually a problem. But uh, I think it's funny that I always get yelled at by the tools I'm using. But if you don't like reading 4,000 words, uh, there is an audio podcast where I read it for you. Um, I don't know. I, I, this was Eric's idea. I don't, I don't know how he started uh, doing this. But uh, I did enjoy this. I've always wanted to do something like this. I like... Uh, uh, this kind of you know, oration and things. So I sit down in front of a nice microphone, I read the whole thing, I edit it together and uh, make it into a little podcast. And it's, uh, I've heard from some people it's a fun thing to put on in the background and not pay very close attention to. So um, <laughs> uh, I, I appreciate that. Uh, this too is web findable, kind of like the, uh, the welcome guide. It's really important to get this information in a way that uh, people can find it uh, pretty easily. So it's a big, it's a, uh, it's a target, it's a, it's a large amount of surface area on the internet find out more about the Mega 65 when they start looking for it. I'm very happy to say I have over uh, 780 email subscribers. Uh, that's not counting the people that find it by RSS or podcast apps, so I actually don't know what the the, the real total is. Um, but that's uh, way more people than currently own Mega 65s, and I'm very excited mm -hmm. about that. I really hope that this newsletter is at least interesting to Commodore enthusiasts in general, and uh, even if they don't own a Mega 65, it's at least interesting to see what's going on. Uh, the Mega 65 is a superset of other Commodores, so a lot of those concepts apply to Commodores, other Commodores as well. Um, other sort of community outreach things, um, last year I did this community survey. Um, it was this uh, large survey. Uh, tried to get as many people to answer as possible. I even invited people that outside of the Mega 65 community that they're sort of Commodore adjacent to say, hey, why don't you answer this survey also and I can learn something about you. Um, this was largely in response to like that previous thing I said about uh, 
uh, uh, you know, the podcast and not really knowing uh, uh, who's listening, who's out there. Um, this was my attempt at saying, okay, who actually, what are the people like when they're out there? Uh, uh, um, they, they, they can hear about the Mega 65, they don't know much about it, or maybe they're already into it. Like, who are you? Um, and so I was ask, uh, asking about that, all this. It was really about measuring reach. Uh, I have a big long write-up on my website if you want to see the results of this. But it was really interesting to, to get this data. I am considering doing more of this, uh, another one of these this year. Um, I do conferences like this one. Um, I was recently uh, kind of on a lark like, like last year. Uh, the 8-bit guy, uh, uh, David Murray, uh, did a video on the Commodore 65, and he made a kind of a passing mention at the end of it. He says, yes, I've heard about the Mega 65, uh, but I've never seen one, so I can't mm. say anything about it. And so just kind of on a whim, I said, how about if I come down to Texas and show you the, the Mega 65? And so he was very gracious. He was very generous with me, and uh, we spent a day together. We talked about the Mega 65. He got a bunch of footage, and he made a, a pretty good video about it that um, I really enjoyed. It did result in some sales. I won't say how many, but it was uh, uh, it was uh, uh, gratifying to uh, uh, talk about the Mega 65 to a wider audience. I, I again, I'm sort of nervous about there are a bunch of people out there that would really care about the Mega 65 but have never heard of it. Or maybe they heard about it five years ago when it was mostly vaporware and they and didn't realize that we've actually shipped the thing. So it was great to get in front of a larger audience for that. The Discord is where everything happens. Um, I, I wish some of it were a little bit more publicly searchable, but it's a very active uh, uh, chat place. Um, and so I'm in there a lot. I do a lot of sort of customer support, answering questions, just hanging out with people in the Discord. I do a little bit of stuff on social media. It's getting much, much less relevant to a project like this now. Uh, I'm on Mastodon now. I used to be on Twitter, but I mostly do Mastodon. I did do a little thing where that file host website I mentioned, um, I set up a bot, so whenever somebody uploads things to that, it gets uh, posted to social media, so you can follow the, the file upload activity for people. Um, I would say you know your audience is really important for this as well. Uh, that survey uh, I did was useful for me. I got a bunch of different answers about what the digest would be like for people. Uh, a lot of people uh, said, I need this uh, to be less technical. I, I'm, I'm an entry-level programmer. I would like less technical material. And then other people said, I need more technical material for this to be interesting. Uh, so knowing your audience is really important for that. Own your own mailing list. I already talked about that. Um, uh, it's uh, uh, critical for something like this. Um, and customer data is important. Like knowing, uh, uh, we, we've, there's certainly uh, uh, people abusing customer data at this point, but even just simple things about what are people looking for, what do they want, uh, what do they care about, uh, being able to gather that and understand it and say, oh yeah, uh, 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 this is worth my time, even when I'm investing in a hobby project is really important. Um, I'll say, uh, I do not know how many people listen to the audio version. I just don't. Uh, the, the tools I'm using don't tell me. And it's very frustrating. It's a, it's a, it really, it's a bug in Substack. I'm using Substack for the audio upload, and they, and they don't give me stats on who listens to it. So I'm, I read it into a microphone, I upload it, and I have no idea where it goes. So, um, sucks. <laughs> I don't know if it's worth it. It's, it's pretty time consuming to put it together. Um, okay. So, uh, yeah, so I've talked about um, a lot of these uh, different areas uh, involving sort of different skill sets. I've been, it's been very gratifying to sort of experiment and dive into each of these different areas and uh, learn and practice these different skill sets. Um, but uh, the main thing that I've learned, and I think the thing that I would tell most people that are interested in joining the Mega 65 project or contributing to it, is the only qualifications for a project like this are time and determination. You don't need any of these skills in advance. You can learn them on a project like this. Uh, I've seen people go from scratch to I really want to get this done and just throwing themselves at it. It's uh, been uh, really gratifying. There are many ways to do retro computing. This is something we all know as participants in this community and this hobby. There are the, lots of different levels of interest, uh, lots of different ways of engaging. Not all of it's programming. You can do technical writing. Um, uh, you can just put things together. You can do it in, on YouTube. Everybody loves it. It's all a contribution. Um, and uh, rely on others to do what you don't do, um, whether it's stuff you don't want to do or stuff you feel like you can't do. Um, having a team like the Mega 65 team uh, has been very rewarding for me. Uh, they uh, are able to sort of fill in the gaps and we can collaborate and share our interests and skills. So if you want to, if something needs to be done but you don't want to do it, whether it's like testing, something as simple as testing, um, you can get other people to help um, and that's been really useful. 
Uh, I hope after you know this and the playing with the Mega 65s uh, in the uh, downstairs, uh, you're more interested in maybe owning a Mega 65 and you can uh, place an order. They are now shipping. Uh, uh, just go to mega65.org for more information there. For a lot of the stuff that I write up, including the digest and other blog entries and things, you can find that on my personal website, dansanderson.com. And uh, please subscribe to my newsletter, uh, m65digest.substack.com. We'll get it to your email inbox. Uh, thank you very much. Any, any questions? Anyone want to do quick round of questions? Good. How did you find the experience of uh, delving into fir the firmware development of the actual VHDL? Did you have to buy tools in order to get into it? Uh, uh, thankfully, uh, no. How, many, how yeah. much documentation is there for that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, uh, the tools, we're able to use a free set of tools. Um, uh, our FPGA can be developed with Vivado tools, and they offer a free community edition set of their tools. Uh, so you can get into it pretty easily that way. Uh, um, it's really useful to have a, a JTAG adapter, which is like a $30 part that you just add to the Mega 65, and it's just a USB cable that goes to your PC, and you can beam new bit streams, as they're called, uh, into the FPGA for testing. <coughs> uh, so that's essential. Um, and as I mentioned, I sort of built a, a, a uh, beefier PC to reduce my build times, but that's not strictly uh, essential. Um, uh, uh, the languages themselves are as old as time, so you can find books you know from 40 years ago on VHDL and Verilog. Um, I didn't actually use a lot of book resources. I did a little bit of web searching for a couple of specific things about syntax and whatnot. I think the trickiest things about CPU design or just uh, that kind of electronics design is understanding the declarative nature of the the language. Uh, it's not an imperative language. You have to sort of build things around the um, uh, clock cycle mechanism of the CPU and, and things. And uh, there are definitely like uh, best practices I'm not at all familiar with. Like I've only done some simple changes, but they've been about you know, pushing things around in temporary registers and getting you know things to line up and stuff. So. Um, uh, I feel like I've got a, you know, an entire career's worth of uh, uh, knowledge to learn about that, but it was really easy to get started, especially for an, an, an established platform uh, that can, I can make simple tweaks to and learn from the existing code. I, I would love to at some point want to take the uh, uh, a framework that somebody made for porting Mr. Cores. Um, they actually uh, wanted to promote that as a way of just getting started with FPGA programming. Like if I want to design my own computer, like my own CPU, my own video chip, I can actually start there because they've already implemented the things that work with the keyboard and the other parts of the Mega 65. And so I can just add my own computer to that framework and, and work on it from there. I think that could be really fun. I haven't tried it yet. Other questions? Uh, yeah, go ahead. I've got a couple of questions. I guess the, the first one is, like, what's the future of the Mega 65? You, you mentioned earlier sort of this vision you had around it being sort of a platform for 8-bit Commodore computers. Yeah. Which I think is kind of a compelling use case. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm just kind of curious, like, is that, are you are you kind of evangelizing that within the Mega 65 community? Or, like, I'm just kind of curious, like, what's the future of the platform? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, specific to it, it being an FPJ platform for other Commodore 8-bits, I think it's something everybody wants. Like everyone sees the hole, the shape of the hole, and they want to fill it. Um, and it's really just a matter of the development resources at this point. Uh, the the team that made the Commodore 64 core also made lots of great resources available. Um, I that would be a really cool summer project I, for me. If I, I'm super excited to get a VIC 20 in there or a plus four. <laughs> um, uh, uh, my dream is the Commodore 128. I would like like oh. all of the Commodore 128 wow. to be in this thing. It has two video outputs, so you can imagine like the HDMI output being one of the screens and the VGA Ooh, output being the other screen. There's a Mr. 128 core you could start. Uh, and that's where you would probably start. Yeah, like there's so much great um, uh, development in the Mr. community that we can uh, leverage for that. Um, it's uh, I don't know if it's really like you click it into this new framework and it just works or not. It's probably a little more complicated. But, uh, um, yeah, I, th I think there's a lot of uh, uh, potential there. Um, uh, as the as far as the platform as a whole goes, I'm uh, my you know my vision is to find people that are interested in, or would be interested in any kind of recreational computing and offer uh, eight bit style computing as a path for that. Uh, with you know, decades of books and, and resources and 
uh, lots of interest from other angles on retro. I think it's a really welcoming space for anyone that just wants to fiddle around with some kind of computing. Um, that's not the only way. I'm, I'm a huge uh, Pico 8 fan. I'm a you know, Picotron and, and all these other things. Uh, just learning Python is, can be really fun. And, like, there's lots of stuff you can do just with your regular PC. But 8-bit um, and retro, I, I, I think, is a, a really fruitful um, and uh, 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 a welcoming way to get into recreational computing for people. So I want to make it accessible to lots of people, a lot of, including people that don't consider themselves programmers. Um, I don't quite know how to get it to that point. I, I really, uh, right now I'm focusing just kind of on the core platform, making sure the ROM is you know, in really good shape, uh, the basic is you know, fleshed out and works really well, and it doesn't have a lot of rough edges for newcomers that are coming to work on it, has really great documentation, is really well tested. Uh, those are all the things I care about right now um, that would be sort of get you know, more outer layers to into the fold. Um, I don't know if that's really everybody's vision. Um, I, I, I feel like that a, a lot of the people that work on this are happy for it to just be a hacking platform. Um, and it's a great hacking platform. Uh, if for Like I said, there's like lots of different layers you can work on if you care about any of those layers. You know. Uh, could uh, have a really good time with this machine, um, uh, but uh, I like outreach. That's, that's kind of my thing. Yeah, maybe that, and maybe that answers my second question, which is, for you, it seems like this has been kind of a slippery slope. Like you started out with, you know, your email digest, and now you're like doing PhDL programming right, to right. some degree. Yeah. And uh, like, maybe you're going to take on a more of a leadership role, or are you going to like? Do you want to? I mean, you're really getting into this. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's kind of amazing <laughs> to see. And uh, are you, I mean, are you, like, what, what's next for you? How are you, what are you going to do in this? this? Uh, uh, so the, the short term for me is going to be a focus on documentation. I, like the, the ROM is nearly, I don't want to say finished, finished, but it's a, 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 a really tightening up in a, in a nice way uh, that it could probably be left the way it is and be a really successful you know, part of the operating system. Um, uh, there's a lot to be done on the documentation. The crazy part about the documentation part is, like I said, the Mega 65 is a superset of all the other Commodores. So the ideal version of Mega 65 documentation was a superset of all Commodore documentation. And uh, that would be you know, a fun lifetime project of some kind, some kind of Commodore encyclopedia or something like that. Um, uh, but realistically, I have to sort of say, okay, well, what would actually be useful? What can I do in a summer? summer's worth of effort or something like that. So um, uh, I'm kind of keeping my eye on that, but there's a, a lot of great material already if we can just get that into a nice form where do it, like I said, do a Kickstarter and a box set of books or something. Maybe only a couple hundred people actually want that, but it would be really fun to produce. Um, getting the user's guide into good shape was really fun. I think I could have a really good time uh, doing that with the rest of the documentation as well. Um, uh, yeah, and uh, I, I think I'm strongly considering just sort of expanding my scope to the rest of Commodore Retro also. I'm, I'm putting a lot of focus on the Mega 65, but uh, uh, there are a lot of people out there in you know, Commodore land that uh, um, I think would enjoy similar things. And I, you know, at some point I'll just say, okay, well, I'm already mostly writing about the Commodore 64 when I write an article on interrupts or kernel programming or something like that. I might as well like, expand my reach uh, with that as well. So. We'll see. Yeah, cool. Thank you. Uh, another question? Yeah. The 65 ROM is licensed from who? Cloanto. Uh, Cloanto. Uh, they are they are a licensor of Commodore Intellectual Property. Um, you can find like if you uh, look for C64 Forever, is like a CD package that they sell with an emulator, a bunch of software on it. Uh, the, they do something similar for the Amiga, Amiga Forever, um, and they are a licensor of uh, Commodore Intellectual Property. And if someone starts creating uh, a ROM, but creating other things with it, does that mean that you, you can't use that anymore? Uh, like, like how? for example, today if you take C64 ROM mm -hmm. you know, and made wedges, all kinds of things to it. Sure. And then they put that away and it's okay, here's a new image for that. Does that mean you can't now with the new one because of licensing? Um, uh, if you wanted to distribute any of the original material with it, you would get yourself into some. Uh, 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 it would be a legal concern. I'll just put it that way. Um, and the way we do it 
is uh, if you own a Mega 65, you have the license, so we just give you the ROM that we've modified. Um, if you met, you know, the, the ROM is maybe like 60% you know, original Commodore code and then 40% R code. Um, and we just give you the whole thing. It comes with a machine. If you uh, uh, own a machine, you, you know, register on the Philos website as an owner, and then you can just download the whole thing. Uh, we also offer uh, to everybody a patch, a binary patch, um, that is just the 40% that we create. So if you happen to have, from somewhere, a Commodore 65 ROM, you can recreate the Mega 65 ROM from that. So if you have it from another source, you can get our portion of it for free. Um, so that's our solution to that problem. Um, the actualities are all a matter of you know, getting challenged in the courts and all that other stuff that nobody wants and can afford to, to mess with. So. Do you distribute the ROM to the emulator then? You, you, you need the full ROM to work with the emulator, and there are instructions to do that patching process that I just mentioned. Nice. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, and look, and Clavanto does distribute it for free. If you get Commodore 64 Forever free edition, the Commodore 65 ROM is in that archive. It's free. It is free. Um, we just don't have a license to distribute it ourselves. Um, so, uh, so yeah, the, the full procedure, fully documented, it's on our website, um, is you get C64 Forever, download it, rip out the C65 ROM, patch it with our changes, and now you've got a Mega 65. For better and for worse. Yes? Um, on the build materials of the Mega 65, what would you say are the highest costs? Like a motherboard, keyboard, floppy drive, the shell? Like what parts are the most? Yeah, um, I'm reluctant to comment because um, I don't know really for sure. Uh, I know that at least at one point the FPGA was so incredibly expensive like hundreds of dollars just for the FPGA. I think that problem has resolved itself. That was part of the supply chain issues that we were experiencing. Um, uh, but I don't really know exactly how it works out. Um, uh, you know, it, it, and I especially don't want to comment in part because I think we get into this idea of, well, why does the Mega 65 cost 666 <laughs> euros? Um, which is a lot of money for people. Like uh, there's a barrier for, a venture, for entry for some people. Um, and I don't know if it's, you know, it's bill of materials. It's uh, you know when, where, and how it's manufactured. It's uh, shipping and uh, parts and, and a bunch of other things. And I'm not privy to the yeah, details. This was, yeah, this was on my mind because yeah. I, I wanted to maybe ask offline. But between the like Commodore 64 Mini, the Amiga Mini, all these new, like new recreations, yeah. and the Mega 65, there's a huge gap. Yeah. And uh, this means we can't have you know 10,000 users or 20,000 users yeah. at this time. Yeah. And while it's affordable for us because we are very interested, people who are casually interested, they won't buy it uh, at Walmart yeah. uh, until we get to some intermediate product. Yeah. That's yeah. maybe less capable, no floppy drive, some people cut off yeah. something that yeah. you can live without. I, I think the only thing that we've speculated about in terms of reducing the cost, I mean, we are all interested in reducing the cost. We know it's a, a barrier for people. Um, and uh, uh, the main thing we have to say is that just getting rid of the floppy drive is not enough of a change <laughs> to really reduce the, uh, the cost meaningfully of the whole thing. If anything, it, uh, it, there's a, a new cost to getting new molds made for the plastic that would be a cost that we'd have to amortize across whoever buys it in the future. Um, uh, I'm not saying we won't do it. But it is tricky. There's, there are a lot of uh, parts to it. So uh, it is really high quality construction. I mean, there's the, the mechanical keyboard. It's you know, modern and mechanical key switches and um, uh, things like that. But yeah, if you open the thing up, it's mostly just the FPGA, the mechanical switches, and the floppy drive. So there's not much else in there. Um, uh, uh, the, the, the case we were able to crowdfund the molds, which I'm super grateful. They're all listed. Everyone who ever gave money to that is listed in the manual. I'm very grateful for them, and so we're trying to get the most out of this, uh, the molds and this design as we can. Um, you know, Commodore themselves plan to cost reduce version of the Commodore 65. Like it's in their roadmap. It's, it's, they're always thinking, as at least in the, the, the versions of the story I've heard, that uh, uh, yeah, start out with a deluxe model and then do a cost reduce version you know, after that and try to capture the rest of the market and stuff like that. And uh, their cost reduce version would have no floppy drive. It was kind of the educational edition. But it was early days for all of them. Like they never released the project, so who knows what they would have done. Yes? Have you heard any news on the 
uh, the portable Mega 65, or was it that? Uh, <laughs> yeah, we talked <laughs> about on with that. We talked about this last year. A, a no new news okay. on the megaphone. Oh, there it is. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, it's still a great project. It's still uh, got good stuff. Um, I think I'm allowed to say. I think it's on their website. We did get some grant funding for that project. Interesting. Um, I don't know how much or how far that will take us, but I, I think it's a minimum viable product grant. Um, that is where we're going to try to finish it. It'll be more like the, the I mean, it'll probably be like the size of a Nintendo Switch or something like that, not something you hold up to your ear. But, um, uh, it'd be like a proof of concept that this is a, uh, using a, a, a vintage design techniques and computer architecture, you can get uh, something that acts as a mobile phone, but gives you all the control of your own technology and your data. So, um, excited about it. I'm uh, looking forward to seeing some progress on it at some point. Any other questions? All right. Thank you so Thank much, Dan. Yeah.